Christ picked a theologian, meaning Paul, as his chosen instrument to compose most New Testament, why did he mostly choose fishermen to be his disciples? You remember that Abraham Lincoln said, God must have loved the common people. He made so many of them. (laughs) And instinctively, we resent tall poppies, particularly in Australia, where we do all we can to cut them down to size. So God purposely chose people pretty much like us to do much of the work in the New Testament. So we would find it very easy to have a sympathetic relationship. Can you please explain John 16, 8 to 10? These are verses about the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 8 to 10, when he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men don't believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to my Father, where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. That's a shorthand summary of what the Holy Spirit does in our minds when we hear the Gospel. The Holy Spirit convicts us that there's a terrible sin to reject God's great gift of Christ. But the acknowledgement of sin is the step towards forgiveness and that righteousness revolves around the fact that Christ has offered his life, it's been accepted by the Father above, He intercedes for us there, so righteous in the word is Christ. The Holy Spirit convinces us about Christ, about our need, guilt, about the remedy, Christ, and about judgment day to come, which underlines the urgency of our seeing things correctly. What is the veil that lies on minds and hearts in 2 Corinthians 3.15? It's talking about the veil of unbelief. The Jews did not see Christ, accept him as the Messiah, veil of unbelief, because they had preconceived ideas, because they misinterpreted the prophecies of the Old Testament, they could not accept the man of Galilee. The veil is unbelief. Is it worth hanging fiercely onto the notion of irreducible complexity? And the question goes on. It's a good question. Faith does not depend upon materialistic evidence. The reason most people come to faith is the Holy Spirit convicts them that there's something in Christ that can be found nowhere else. The ground for faith is not primarily any materialistic scientific evidence, though there is abundance of such. The human brain is the most complicated thing in the universe and it makes every second thousands of decisions. Now scientists can weave theories about how that came to be, but none of them can come up with a brain. None of them. And some scientists will go so far as to say the eye is not a perfect optical instrument, but they can't come up with an eye. Faith is very simple for a man who knows no science either an eternal nothing made matter and mind or an eternal matter made mind and matter or an eternal mind made mind and matter. You don't have to be a scientist to work out which one is the more likely of the three. From an eternal nothing, nothing comes. And as for eternal matter, It can produce matter and chaos, but it can't produce order of the type that we have in the human brain. The only alternative is an eternal mind created matter and mind. Many a man who works for the farmlands or as a painter or someone that is not a professional sees more clearly sometimes than people with a great education. They say, hey, if we were nearer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we were further from the sun, we'd freeze up. If the moon was a lot bigger, the earth would be flooded over at least twice a day. You know, there are some very obvious things. But the miracle of thought is something science has never, ever been able to explain. 
this agitation of microscopic bit of matter that makes sense of the universe, that is a miracle. And let no one ever talk you out of it. The miracle of thought. So you don't have to get into arguments on irreducible complexity because you can make a case on both sides. Why do so many translations leave out Acts 8.37? The reason for the changes in translations is that in the last 50 years we've come into possession of many more early Bible manuscripts. No Bible manuscript is perfect because human beings produce them. Sometimes they nodded, sometimes they repeated, sometimes they omitted. You and I know what it is if we're spending hours on a document. It's so easy to make a mistake. And there are thousands of mistakes in the old Bible manuscript. But when you put them all together, you can find out which are the mistakes. And when they do that, some things accepted in some of the earlier versions are omitted in the later versions because they are not found in the most reliable early manuscripts. But their substance is found in other verses that are accepted. So it should never disturb us if one version leaves out a passage that's found in another. <coughs> the last one, and I don't think I have a good answer for this one. In Leviticus, the priest exits the camp to cleanse the leper with two sparrows, cedar wood, scarlet and hyssop. Can you please explain how the scarlet and hyssop relate to Christ's sacrifice? Hyssop was like a weed growing outside everybody's door. It is a symbol of faith. It is a symbol of the fact that salvation is available to anyone who will stoop with the stoop of faith to accept the gift. The scarlet probably is there because it was used very often with things that are kingly. And so you have the contrast between a gift from the king and the hyssop faith, the weed, available to everybody to accept the gift. Now we're looking at John 4, and we could call this how to solve your problems. So you understand this is another case where the passage is worth a million, which we will collect at the door. <laughs> John chapter 4. Please, uh, please look here. I want you to look first. Let me see. I want you to look at the end of the chapter first, please. Jesus heals the official's son. 43, chapter 4, verse 43. After two days he left for Galilee. Jesus had pointed out a prophet has no honour in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They'd seen all he'd done in Jerusalem. Once more he visited Cana, where he turned the water to wine. And here a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum turns up. And when the man hears that Jesus is there, he went to him, begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. So here's a real problem. Many of the things you and I think are problems are not real problems. It's a good idea to keep a diary. If you keep a diary, you'll find that the things that worried you to death six months ago have suddenly disappeared in the interim. Most of the things that worry us to death are not really great problems. They are solved by time in most cases. And our fears bring us more pain than the thing we fear. So it's a lot better and cheaper to try trust and faith rather than fear. But anyway, this man has a real problem. His son is at the point of death. And Jesus says, oh, unless you people see miracles, sign, you'll never believe. And the man said, sir, he won't argue, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replies, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news his boy was living. He inquired as the time when his son got better. They said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realised this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed. Sorrow was the angel that blessed this household and so it is with us if we will permit it to be so. 
the things that seem terrible weights and burdens that we hate and detest, accepted by faith, can be angels to us and bring blessing. Sorrow, a son's near death experience, brought this family to eternal life. But I want you to notice the sequence. What do we do with our real problems? Well, one, we take them to Jesus. Oh, you say, just praying, yes, but that's not enough. What else do we do? We accept from Jesus the promise that all will be well. The Bible has 3,000 promises, so you shouldn't find it difficult to find a promise from Christ that all things will work together for good if you love God. So you accept from Jesus a promise. Third, you go your way and plot your course on the assurance that it will be, as he said, doesn't matter how you feel. Now the last part's very important. Faith is not feeling. Faith is not feeling. Your feelings can be altogether against what you want to believe and you can exercise faith. Faith is when you make decisions that are based on the assurance that what Christ said is true and reliable and you make those decisions, it doesn't matter how you feel. This is terribly important. Many Christians have got the idea, hey, once I'm converted, I'll never have a bad feeling. That's rubbish. You're still human. You're still clay. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, your feelings will constantly rise up in rebellion against your faith. What do you do? You treat them as a mother treats children in a nursery that are playing up. The will is the wise mother that makes the decisions regardless of all the crying, the shouting, the weeping and whatever's going on. Ignore your feelings, make decisions in harmony with the word of God and all will be well. Let me repeat, you take the problem to Jesus. Then you accept from him the promise, all will be well. Then you make decisions in harmony with that promise regardless of how you feel and you go your way with the assurance it'll be as he promised and it doesn't matter if tides of emotion sweep over you recurringly. It cannot be, it will not be, it's awful, it's deadly, it's the end, I'm finished. Feelings are not reliable. Escalators up and down, up and down. Great saint in the Middle Ages says, my son, regard not thy feelings. Whatever they are now, they'll shortly be changed into another thing. Never forget that. Whatever your feelings are now, however down, however despairing, they'll shortly be changed into another thing. So you don't live by feeling. You live by faith. So that story tells us how to deal with all our problems. Take them to Jesus, find a promise that fits your need, make decisions in harmony with that promise, regardless of how you feel, and go ahead with the assurance all will be well in God's time and way. Now back to the beginning of the chapter. I had to make sure you got that because we all have problems. (laughs) Fortunately, 